Now let's continue our discussions of microbial diseases in the various parts of the body. We're ready to move into Chapter 24, where we'll, we will discuss the diseases of the respiratory system. Now first, let's think about how we can get an infection in our respiratory tract. This is sort of going back to the things that we learned in Chapters 14 and 15. In your respiratory tract, you inhale many bacteria, viruses, protozoan, protozoan cysts constantly every day. The reason you do not always end up with an infection is because you have several protective structures lining your respiratory tract. If we begin in the nasal cavity, many things are not even allowed to enter the nasal cavity because it is filled with very small hairs that act as little filters. In addition to the hairs in the nasal cavity, the nasal cavity is the first place where you begin to have mucus production. The mucus in your nasal cavity, as well as throughout the different parts of your respiratory system, works to catch any pathogen that comes in. As you breathe in, the pathogen gets trapped in the mucus and it can't go any further. Moving further down the respiratory tract, it is lined with cilia. So any pathogen caught in the mucus is moved with, by the cilia back towards the opening of the digestive system so that it can be swallowed and removed from your respiratory tract. In addition to the mucus, the cilia, and the nasal hairs, you have tonsils that border the entrance of your nasal cavity and your oral cavity. The tonsils are full of little immune system cells that help to catch and kill any pathogen that comes into those. We have four different words that describe the diseases that occur throughout the respiratory tract. Anytime you have an infection that causes an inflammation of your throat, we call this pharyngitis. If you have an inflammation of your larynx due to an infection, we call this laryngitis. Laryngitis is distinguished from pharyngitis in two ways. Typically, both are going to have a sore throat occurring, but most of the time, pharyngitis is going to have the more sore throat. Laryngitis will have the slightly sore throat, but if you have laryngitis, that's when your vocal abilities are going to be interrupted and you're going to have some difficulty speaking. Tonsillitis is the term for an inflammation of your tonsils. Tonsillitis suggests that you have an infection, a pathogen, that has made it into your tonsils and your immune system is working to kill these pathogens in your tonsils. Sinusitis is an inflammation of the tonsils and an inflammation or drainage in the sinus cavities. As, we are, as I am recording this lecture right now, we are in pollen season, so many of you have probably been to the doctor and been diagnosed with sinusitis. It simply means a pathogen, they don't usually have any idea what type, but a pathogen has invaded your sinuses and caused inflammation and drainage. These are all just generic diseases caused by many different bacterial infections in your respiratory tract. Now let's look at a few specific diseases. I'm sure we have all heard of strep throat. Strep throat is the term we use for a streptococcus infection in the pharynx or the throat. Sometimes you can have strep throat due to a streptococcal infection in the tonsils. Strep throat is diagnosed with an extremely sore throat and a very high fever. The streptococcus that causes strep throat most commonly is called streptococcus pyogenes. Pyogenes comes from the word pyro for fire due to the extremely high fevers we typically see with strep throat. Scarlet fever is a very similar infection to strep throat, but the streptococci that causes scarlet fever not only infects the different parts of the respiratory system, but as your phagocytic cells destroy the streptococcus, it releases a toxin that moves out to the outer layers of the skin in the oral cavity and the tongue, leading to an extremely red rash. The red rash shown here in this picture is scarlet fever on the skin, but you would also have a similar rash on the tongue and the inside of the mouth. 
Diphtheria is a respiratory infection caused by the bacteria Cornibacterium diphtheriae. When you get this infection, you must inhale it by droplet transmission, meaning someone else has to have the bacteria growing in their, in their tonsils. Once you inhale the bacteria, it be begins to reside in your tonsils, first leading to a sore throat, fever, some fatigue, typical signs of a tonsillitis. The way we know it is diphtheria and not just a generic infection causing the tonsillitis is people begin to have a swelling of the neck due to the overwhelming infection in the tonsils and the lymph nodes. Eventually, your, lymph, your immune system wins to an extent that the toxins begin to be produced by the bacteria. Once the toxins are produced, they form a membrane on the tonsils, and that is what's shown here in this picture. Your tonsils, or your pharyngeal tonsils, extend out of the side in the very back of your oral cavity. These tonsils have this pus-filled membrane. Once someone develops this membrane, it becomes very difficult for them to breathe. Many of you have never heard of the disease diphtheria because as a child you were all vaccinated against diphtheria. The D in the DTP vaccine is what protects us from a Cornibacterium diphtheriae infection. Our next bacterial disease of the respiratory tract is tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is sort of a complex disease to discuss because this bacteria can exist in people in different states. Some people that inhale the mycobacterium simply become a carrier. Their immune system can keep the infection under control enough that they carry the bacteria and never become infected themselves. However, carriers can transmit the disease to other people. Some people inhale the bacillus-shaped mycobacterium tuberculosis and become infected. This picture over here is showing you what typically happens in the lining of the lungs, in a portion of the lungs called the alveoli. The alveoli are the very bottom piece of the lungs where you have gas exchange occur. As you inhale the bacteria, your macrophages ingest the bacteria. This, however, is a bacteria that can survive inside of your macrophages. Once the bacteria gets inside of one macrophage, the macrophage can't kill it, but it begins to send out a chemotaxic signal to call for help. So then you end up with this large patch of macrophages in the lining of your lungs, all of which form what we call a tubercle. Once the tubercle forms, the bacteria begin to really grow inside of the macrophages until they destroy the macrophage, leak out, eventually rupturing the tubercle, moving throughout the respiratory tract, leading to the signs of an active tuberculosis infection. An active infection makes somebody have difficulty breathing due to an inflammation in the lungs. And that person is also going to have an extremely common repetitive cough. The cough, unfortunately, helps to spread the bacteria to other people. Tuberculosis is most common in people that are slightly immunocompromised or very old. Most people that are young are more often going to be a carrier of the infection than someone actually infected. A very common bacterial disease is pneumonia. Pneumonia is not a generic word, but it's a word used for an infection of many different types of bacteria in the lungs. When someone has pneumonia, they are going to be characterized by uh, sometimes a fever, but difficulty breathing, chest pain, and they're going to be coughing up lots of mucus. The reason they are coughing a lot of mucus is the body is producing excess mucus to try to get whatever bacteria that has come into the body out. The most common bacterial cause of pneumonia is Streptococcus pneumoniae. 
Streptococcus pneumoniae is the one that is found virtually everywhere on Earth. And if inhaled under the right conditions, people will develop pneumonia. Haemophilus influenza is a normal microbiota of the respiratory tract. Therefore, it does not harm most people. But we see this bacteria causing pneumonia in people that are alcoholic, extremely malnutritioned, people with other medical conditions such as cancer, diabetes, HIV, or some other similar infection. Mycoplasma pneumoniae is the bacteria responsible for what we call walking pneumonia. It is called walking pneumonia because people are able to live their normal life and do their normal daily duties. Symptoms are extremely mild, but can last for up to three weeks. The reason the symptoms last so long, even when antibiotics are taken, is because the genus Mycoplasma happens to be the only bacterial genus that does not have a cell wall made of peptidoglycan. Therefore, generic antibiotics that are aimed at the bacterial cell wall will not efficiently kill this bacteria. A very serious bacterial infection of the respiratory tract is called pertussis. The common name for pertussis is whooping cough. Whooping cough is caused by the bacteria Bordetella pertussis. In order to contract pertussis, you must have contact with someone that is infected or someone that is a carrier. Most people in the United States are not going to be infected with pertussis, but they're going to be carriers. As a child, we receive that DTP vaccine. The P in the DTP vaccine protects us from pertussis. However, as the years roll by and we have not been exposed to pertussis, our vaccine begins to wear off. Our memory cells begin to die. Therefore, we may begin to inhale the bacteria and hold it in our body without it causing an infection. This is a very serious problem because children cannot be vaccinated against pertussis until they are three months old. We started seeing a problem with children under the age of three months becoming infected with pertussis from their mothers that were carriers simply because their vaccination had worn off over time. Once you inhale the bacteria, if you are not protected by the vaccine, the bacteria destroy the cilia in your trachea, making it impossible for you to remove the mucus out of your respiratory tract. The mucus then begins to build in your respiratory tract, causing you to cough uncontrollably in an attempt to try to remove the mucus from the respiratory tract yourself. The infection of pertussis goes through three different stages. The first stage is just a normal cough that is often mistaken for a cold. After the normal cough progresses for a few days, then you move into the second stage of whooping cough. The second stage involves violent coughing. This is uncontrolled coughing that typically has a whooping sound in between the coughs, hence the common name whooping cough. It has been noted with people having such violent coughing spells that they would break their own ribs during this coughing session. The final stage of pertussis is an uncontrolled coughing that causes the person to not be able to inhale enough oxygen in between the coughs. Babies have been noted to have brain damage and even die due to a lack of oxygen in this ending stage. It is now a requirement for all mothers to receive a DTP vaccine booster once they are ready to have their child so that they cannot so that they will not be a carrier and transmit the infection into to their child. However, this is not completely curing the new emerging outbreak we are having with pertussis. We also have a large group of people that do not believe in vaccinating their children. Therefore, these people are growing up prone to the infection themselves and definitely being prone to being a carrier. The last respiratory infection to discuss this semester is a viral infection instead of a bacterial infection. We commonly call this infection the flu. The proper name for the virus is influenza. 
most of us know what the symptoms of the flu are. People with the flu are going to have chills, fever, headache, and often muscle aches. Many people describe the flu as once you have the flu, you just feel like you cannot move. The main thing I wanted to discuss with you about the flu is why we call different strains of the flu H something, N something, and why we worry about different epidemics of the flu more one season than another, and also why do we have to get a flu vaccine every year. So if you take a look at the picture over here, you notice that influenza is an enveloped RNA virus. The envelope itself has many different spikes. The two most important spikes sticking off of the influenza envelope are called the HA spike and the NA spike. The H spikes and N spikes are different depending on which species the flu is going to infect. So every year, a vaccination is made against the human influenza that humans are going to take. That's going to be something like H3N2, or maybe next year H2N2 is the particular strain we're worried about. When we make the flu vaccine, we are making an educated guess using computer simulation models to predict what the most likely cause of the flu will be the next year. So you have to get your flu vaccine every year because the flu itself mutates and changes every year. A lot of you may remember back in about 2009-2010, we had an issue with the swine flu. Well, once all of the farmers got mad about it, the news stopped calling it the swine flu, and they started calling it H1N1. The H1N1 tells us the number of the NA and HA spikes. That tells us that this is a flu that infects mostly swine or pigs and not humans. The reason that was such a big deal in the news a few years ago was because the most recent pandemic we've had of the flu, really serious large outbreak, was in 1918 through 1919. This pandemic was caused by an H1N1 virus that mutated to jump species from swine to humans. So when we saw these increasing cases of an H1N1 virus in 2009, we started worrying this could be our next influenza pandemic. It turned out not to be as serious as we thought, but we always are better safe than sorry. So we made a big deal about it, really amped it up, made some vaccines just in case we were potentially going to have our next pandemic. That is our last infection of the respiratory tract that we're going to discuss this semester. Now we're ready to move into Chapter 25.